Tsar Peter I was fundamentally different than every Tsar who had come before him. Most were content with ruling their Tsardom on the fringe of Europe and being considered Oriental, or backwards, by the Western nations such as France and the Netherlands. But the young Tsar Peter was not satisfied with the surroundings he grew up in, and eventually became determined to remake Russia on the Western model he had glimpsed through the foreigners that were his tutors and the craftsmen and merchants who traveled all the way to Moscow to sell their wares. Keep this in mind, this will be very important later. Quick side note before we continue, as this video is not an in-depth analysis into Peter the Great, I would recommend Peter the Great, His Life and World by Robert K. Massey. It provided much of the background information, and it's just a good read in general. I, I, it's one of my favorite history books, actually, of all time, so do check it out. It is painful, but I will also be skimming over most of his modernization efforts and early life, as it is not that essential to this particular video, as it's just one event later in his life, and we just need the very specific information to get there. Anyway, his later territorial expansion of the Tsardom of Russia had given the country access to the sea for the first significant time in its history. His wars against the Turks expanded Russia to the shores of the Black Sea, and his victories against Sweden in the north gave Russia access to the Baltic. For the first time, Russia had its taste of the juicy warm water ports it had become so addicted to throughout its history. And along with conquering shoreline, of course, comes the responsibility to hold it. With both the Ottomans and the Swedes across their respective bodies of water from Russia, it was imperative the Russians build their fleets to defend their new territory. This is just what Peter set out about to do. Peter's personality, hobbies, and position of power were perfectly suited to building a navy from the ground up, forming the basis for the awe-inspiring Russian navy we all know and love today. Part of this grand quest to build a navy was to build it on the western models he found so interesting. He understood the success that the Dutch and English were having, and wanted to directly emulate that for defending his own beloved country. The culmination of his western fascination, seeking knowledge about western shipbuilding techniques as well as trying to build up an anti-Turk alliance, led him to actually be the first Tsar to ever leave Russia during peacetime, actually journeying to western Europe, leaving Russia in 1697. Even during wars, the previous Tsars had never gone very far mostly just accompanying their armies on campaign. But as we have discussed, Peter was no ordinary czar. Before he left, he ordered all mail from Moscow censored as to give him as much of a head start as possible on his journey west, as he was to travel not as Peter Alexeyevich Romanov, czar of Russia, but instead as... I'm kidding, it was just as Peter Mikhailov, who just so happened to be accompanying the Russian ambassadors on their journey. Peter hated formality and lengthy receptions, where he thought he would be better off using his time to learn as much as he could during his trip abroad, making an alias all the more useful. It is really also worth noting that a significant amount of antics would actually ensue from him traveling incognito, considering he was 6'8", and it wasn't, that part wasn't a secret, <laughs> essentially confusing everyone as he went, since most people knew who he was, but also were not supposed to know who he was. It would mostly cause ambassadors and dignitaries who he was meeting with to be extremely confused because they had no idea how to deal with the situation, as well as almost bankrupting some cities as he went through because they weren't actually expecting the Tsar to show up, but then they actually had to like find the money to deal with the Tsar that who wasn't supposed to actually be there. The main places he intended to visit on his grand tour were the Netherlands, from where he would apprentice himself to master shipbuilders so he could take back this knowledge to help start the Russian Navy himself. And when I say apprentice, I really do mean that in the full sense of the word, doing everything an average apprentice would do in a Dutch shipyard in 1697. He then continued on his journey to visit the famous shipbuilders in England and meet the British King William III, who interestingly enough gifted the Tsar a royal yacht to take back to Russia. Unfortunately, a recent diplomatic debacle between Russian ambassadors and the French court at Versailles made it impossible for Peter to travel to France and meet the Sun King, Louis XIV. It mainly involved Russians trying to smuggle a load of furs into France when they were on their diplomatic mission before Peter arrived. The reason for them doing so was that the Russian ambassadors were actually paid in their furs and had to sell them as they made their way across Europe to pay for their travels. Peter, having to skip France, moved on to Vienna, the penultimate leg of his journey. And when he was just about to leave for Venice, the last point of his journey, where he would meet the famous galley makers and shipbuilders of Venice, Peter received news that four regiments of Streltsy soldiers, notorious for rebelling often against the Tsar, had revolted and were marching on Moscow. It is worth noting that Peter had already severely limited their power by removing Streltsy regiments from Moscow and dispersing them across Russia. But they were still viewed as a threat as they had sided against him in favor of his sister and brother in the past. The letter regarding the rebellion was over a month old and did not have any other information regarding what was happening back in Russia. Fearing he was about to be overthrown, 
Peter immediately set out for Moscow, ending his grand embassy to Western Europe. Although his grand embassy was cut short, Peter would eventually thankfully return and see Versailles for himself. In 1717, Peter would again make a journey west, this time with the main attraction being Paris. He stayed for a total of six weeks. Coming with a prepared list of everything he wanted to see in the famous center of French culture. The Palace of Versailles, once the physical manifestation of power of the French King Louis XIV, is still to this day one of the most beautiful architectural achievements ever built. At the time, in the late 17th and early 18th century, it would have been even more impressive, especially to the Tsar who admired everything Western. Peter arrived at Versailles from Paris on the night of May 24, 1717. He spent the entirety of the next day exploring the palace and its grounds. When the French duke that was supposed to give him the tour of Versailles arrived the next morning, the Tsar was nowhere to be found. He eventually found Peter rowing a boat on the palace garden's famous Grand Canal. The Tsar was apparently immensely impressed with the gardens and the fountains rather than the actual palace itself, which he called a pigeon with the wings of an eagle, in reference to the massive palace Louis XIV had added to his father's original small hunting lodge that still remained and remains the center of the palace. With this new first-hand knowledge of seeing the famous Versailles gardens for himself, he was inspired to have his own version at home. The seed had been planted in Peter's imagination for what would become Peterhof Palace. The location Peter would eventually choose to build Peterhof actually already had a small palace already on the grounds. The Montplaisir Palace, which translated from French as my pleasure or my delight, is of course more resembling a small cottage than an actual palace. It's also worth noting that for one of such stature, Peter loved small houses and cottages, and would often prefer living there instead of in the large palaces that he commissioned. Construction had started in 1714 on this small Dutch-inspired red brick house on the coast of the Gulf of Finland. The location was chosen as it had views of the sea, the naval base at Kronstadt Island, and St. Petersburg itself, combining all of Peter's loves within sight of each other. But as mentioned, the location of one of his favorite small cottages would eventually be the location for which he would decide to build Peterhof. At Peterhof, the buildings are not as grand or ornate as Versailles, but they are not the main attraction as remember Peter was unimpressed by the giant complex in France. Rather, the fountains that Peter commissioned would become even more impressive than the ones which they took their inspiration from. Not having to rely on pumps to power the fountains as Versailles did, it being on low ground, technically in what used to be a swamp, Peterhof was able to give more power to its fountains as the water was piped in from higher ground 13 miles away, therefore leading to more impressive taller plumes of water. The other technical improvement it made over Versailles was that Peterhof was able to run its fountains all day, whereas due to low water pressure and even just available water, Versailles could only run the fountains as the king walked around, having a servant run in front and behind him to turn on the fountains one at a time, with special valves set into the walkways. Personally, having visited both, just take a look. To me, there, there really is a visual difference to which ones are the more magnificent of the two, in my opinion, at least. Even ignoring the visual stunners, which are the main attraction of Peterhof, Peter was a well-known lover of mechanical inventions and playing tricks and jokes on people. He combined the two by having the entire garden hidden with water traps and little jokes. For example, among the trees, he had fake trees put in the garden, and when activated from his hiding place behind some bushes, they would erupt with water and drench anyone who happened to be wandering through the garden. In particular, he would aim to get the women with their massive western-style wigs, which would be ruined if they got wet. Another weird side note, I don't know how good he actually was at hiding, considering he was 6'8", but, you know, that that's the tale that's told. And that the trees do exist, and all the traps do exist, so, you know. Anyway, here's another example. It's a maze that you have to step on the right set of stones to make it across, or you get sprayed with jets of water. Okay, I lied, there's actually a clever trick with this one. There's a guy who sits at the bench next to it. And whenever he decides that he doesn't like the person crossing the maze, with his cane in the ground, he twists it and the water erupts, making you think that it's you making a mistake, but it's just the old man or whoever happens to be sitting there messing with you. Presumably, this would have been Peter messing with his guests. The amazing thing to me is that he basically created a beautiful water park for himself in the early 18th century, before even the flush toilet was invented. Personally, this is just what makes Peterhof so much more special, at least in the gardens from Versailles. Maybe not the historical aspect, obviously Versailles has a lot more going for it, but just like the visuals and the technology involved. In the early 1700s, 
at Peterhoff is just utterly fascinating to me that he was able to pull this off. And th it all still works. Which brings me to a sad point in the video, which speaking of everything working, I have to mention that during the Second World War, Peterhoff is just outside of St. Petersburg. You can probably guess where this is going, as it was just far enough outside of St. Petersburg that it was occupied by the German army during the siege of the city. And during their retreat, they partially blew up the palace and set it on fire. However, most of the gardens actually survived and have been fully restored. But unfortunately, most of the interior of the palace is actually still under renovation and restoration after the war, which is incredible. Just, just take a moment to like think about that. It was so ruined that they're still working on it today. Anyway, I just wanted to share this relatively unknown location as I find its relatively small place in history just fascinating and beautiful. Sources will be down below.